This is the recording for the Unit 5 practice test on solids, liquids, and gases. So, you wish to bolt a sign to a horizontal I-beam supporting bridge. You will weaken the beam least if you drill the bolt holes through the web, because if you drill to the upper or lower flange, you either produce too much tension or too much compression, and you weaken it. There's a nice drawing in one of the next time questions for that. This one here I made up a while ago, a few years ago, because it caught my attention. So this is real, a real silver coin from Canada. It's worth a million dollars, the gold that you see here. It's pure gold. That's what it says here. And it's 100.0 kilograms. Yes, it is that accurate for sig fig. It has a diameter of 53 centimeters and the thickness of three centimeters. Those are the data that are given on the Canadian website. But then notice the decline in sig fig. So here they give us four sig fig, and then they end up with just one, which means the result can only be one. So when you do this calculation, you will come up actually with a result for the density of gold that is somewhat off from the real one. The real one is, I believe, top of my head, 19.32. But you will see that's actually not going to be the result once you do the calculation. So, and of course, the calculation is density equals mass divided by volume. Well, the mass is given, but you have to determine the volume. Notice that this is a disk. So it's the area of a circle, pi r squared, times the height or the thickness. Nothing to convert, by the way. Just keep it in keep the volume and the dimensions in centimeters. All right, let's see. Spring is stretched 10 centimeters to suspend by a suspended one kilogram block. And what about if you do two springs? Well, it'll be only five centimeters. They share the weight. Consider a fictional case of the incremental shaking man. If your shrink is proportional to one tenth of its original height, as weight will be multiplied by one thousandth, so 0 0.001. Scaling describes the weight of an object, describes that the weight of an object depends on its three-dimensional structure, while the strength of an object depends on the two-dimensional cross-section of its supports, such as the cross-section of muscles, or such as the cross-section of the pillars on a bridge. Match the following animals with their weight to, to strength ratio. Also, the, the structure of any kind of building, it's, it's the um, the actual structure inside the walls that are carrying the weight of the building, it's the cross section there, not, not the height or anything else. So it's only two dimensional, the strength. While the uh, weight, of course, is, goes with the three dimensional. So here we consider the ant as the strongest animal because for a weight of only one, it can carry 50 times as much. Because when you scale something down, like the size of an ant, the weight goes down dramatically in three dimensions, while the strength actually only goes down in two dimensions. By the way, these could be scrambled here, so be a little bit careful. The mouse is um, still relatively strong, so the mouse can carry twice its own weight, so the weight to strength ratio. The mule, three to one, so you can only put one third of its weight on, on the mule and the elephant being really big, but it can only carry one-seventh of its own weight. And that's, of course, why the elephant has such big trunks in order to actually carry its big weight. That's the, that's the thing for large land animals, the hippopotamus, the rhinoceros, the elephant. The only um, one that's different is the giraffe. but um, there, are, there is another reason why the giraffe actually has rather spindly legs. Look it up. If eat, why that is? It has to do with the, with the um, giraffe not passing out when they're taking a drink from a pond. That has to do with why its legs are actually rather thin. If each dimension of a steel bridge is scaled up 10 times, its strength will be multiplied by about 100 but it's weight by 1,000. I'm still wondering how they do that, how they model it in an engineering firm. When they build a scale model of the, of the steel bridge, they just cannot 
reproduce the actual strength of it because the scaling is just just off. The the weight is well one thousandth, but the strength is is one hundredth, so it's disproportional. So. All right, a dam is thicker at the bottom than at the top, partly because water pressure is greater with increasing depth water. So we're changing subject now. So we had solids a moment ago, and now we're going to be of liquids. Later on, we're going to be of gases. So a dam is thicker at the bottom than at the top, partly because water pressure is greater with increasing depth. Pressure, water, water pressure, hydrostatic pressure depends on the density, on gravity, and on the depth. So this is the one answer here. Uh, somebody could say, oh, you know, water is denser at deeper levels. It is, but very, very slightly. We're talking about fractions of a percent. While depth, you know, you go to twice the depth and you have twice the hydrostatic pressure. The pressure at the bottom of a jug filled with water does not depend on, well, let's see, it depends, as I just said, hydrostatic pressure depends on the density. It depends on the acceleration due to gravity, as I just said G a moment ago. It depends on the depth, which means the height of the liquid. So those are the three things it depends on, which means, no, it does not depend on the surface area of the water. So a small vessel that is 50 feet deep, which is 60 meters, small vessel, is the same as the edge of an ocean that is also 16 meters or 50 feet deep. It's the same water pressure at that depth. All right, pumice is a volcanic rock that, rock that floats. Its density is less than the density of water. And if you look at pumice, then you'll see it has a lot of air holes. And hence, yeah, that's why its density is actually less. Completely submerged object always displays its own volume of fluid. A partially submerged object would displace its own weight. And then that would be also the equivalent volume of the, of the fluid, weight of the fluid and volume of the fluid, if it was not completely submerged. Blood pressure is normally greater in your feet as we're standing up. The word normally is in here is because sometimes we're lying down and or for long periods of time we're lying down and therefore the blood pressure doesn't have to be that much greater. But usually as we're standing up or sitting down, blood pressure in your feet is usually greater. When holes are drilled to the wall of a water tower, water will spout out with the greatest speed from the hole close to the water because that's the, where the hydrostatic pressure is the largest. This question here could be reworded as follows. When holes are drilled to the wall of a water tower, water will spout out the farthest distance and from the hole, and then it turns out actually, no, that would be ambiguous because if the if the hole that's closest to the bottom of the of the tower is actually right above the ground, because it's not really a tower, then actually it will won't go anywhere. So the better question is, where does it spout out with the greatest speed? And that will be yeah, the bottom of the tower because that's where it has the largest hydrostatic pressure. Compared to an empty ship, the same ship loaded with styrofoam will float low in the water. The styrofoam here sounds kind of strange, right? But it once you put it into the ship, it adds weight to it. So the water has to go down. If you were to strap that styrofoam to the outside of the hull of the ship, yes, then because it displaces more water, it will actually um, make the ship flow float somewhat higher. Let's see. The, um, and there, there's a bunch of next time questions that address that as well. To multiply the input force of hydraulic lift, the input end should be the one having the smaller diameter piston, which means that you can also use the smaller input force so that at the larger diameter piston, you get a larger output force force. The drawback, of course, is that in the smaller diameter piston, there is less water in it. Or, or whatever fluid we're using, hydraulic fluid, oil. And, and so there isn't as much, as much volume there that you're pushing, which means when it gets to a larger diameter piston, it's not much water, oil, um, fluid that is being pushed. And so it doesn't get up as high. Again, with a simple machine or any kind of machine, we are not getting a free lunch. 
we have to make a compromise at the very least with the hydraulic lift we can get the work done. And hydraulic press operation. Note that technically you could switch input and output pistons, even though practically that wouldn't be desirable, it is impossible for the energy output to exceed the energy input that would violate the conservation of energy. I put that long parentheses in here years ago because a po student pointed out, well, if you turn them around, which usually wouldn't do, then one of the others could be actually correct. Let's see. Um, this one here, of course, that's totally possible. That's why we use that hydraulic press operation. So that's totally possible. The output piston speed to exceed the inputs. OK, maybe that was the one. And this one here as well. If you turn them around, actually, then, then if, if you press on, on the larger diameter one, the other one actually would go how higher I have that, I mean, faster and, and further. So these two could be correct if you, these two could be correct if you were to turn the hydraulic press operation around. That's why I put that long um, parentheses there. I have in one of the videos for the um, for this unit five, I have a video in there where we're using the syringes and we're pushing against each other. And you can see that if, if you push the larger piston, yes, the, the other one will go further and faster out. But in any case, the way I worded it, it's that this one is always impossible. Surface tension is a direct result of cohesive forces between molecules and in a liquid. And then there would be others like capillary action, which would be a direct result of adhesive forces between molecules in liquid and solid. A balloon is buoyed up with a force equal to the weight of the air that it displaces which then is also equivalent to the volume of the air, because volume of and weight of air are connected with the density of air. A bubble of air released from the bottom of a lake becomes larger as it rises, because there would be less hydrostatic pressure on it. In drinking soda water through a straw, we make use of actually atmospheric pressure. What we're doing in, in our mouth is we're, we're reducing the atmospheric pressure so that the atmospheric pressure that's on top of the liquid actually will push it through the straw. That's why when you have lids on, on a soda can, which has no extra hole in it, you actually can only suck up the liquid so far, the soil so far, and then you actually have to release it so that actually air can come back in, or you just simply poke a hole into the lid, and so you always have atmospheric pressure on top of the liquid. About how high can water be theoretically lifted by a vacuum pump at sea level? 10.3 meters, because that's what the air pressure allows you. So one atmospheric pressure is the equivalent to 10.3 meters of water pressure. So if you reduce it by one atmosphere, yeah, you can only pump 10.3 meters worth of, of water. Up, that is. The flight of a blimp best illustrates buoyancy. So that would be principle of Archimedes. A curveball in baseball illustrates the Magnus effect. This is perhaps the only question in the entire class that you cannot find in the book. The book actually doesn't mention the Magnus effect. Look it up, curveball on baseball. Sometimes you get the wrong explanation. Sometimes you get yeah, the other one that I don't like to mention. It's the Magnus effect. Lift of airplane flight is described by, and again, you can, here's, oh, here's another one. OK, so I take that back. When it, when it comes to, unfortunately, the Bernoulli principle, there it is. I said it. The Bernoulli principle is so much mis guided, misused, that, and, and you find in physics books, you find in engineering books, you find in aviation books, and it's, uh, it's just not enough to make an airplane fly. So, but unfortunately, because it is a simple explanation, you will find it in physics books, in engineering books, in aviation books, and it's just not true. It, it's not enough. Um, the Coanda effect is part of that as well. So yeah, do do look that up. Newton's second law, Newton's third law. The the lift of an airplane is really in physics in a 
basic physics class, most difficult one for me to explain. I have a big folder on, on you know, when, when I prep that I have to read through and I still don't have the greatest explanation when I'm done. When water is turned in a shower, the shower curtain moves towards the water. This has to do with pressure of a moving fluid. They do omit the Bernoulli in this case here, but in this case, actually, that's kind of what it is. Consequence of adhesion is, and I think these are all getting checked, capillary action of water, the concave minuscule of water on the edge of a glass, so where water likes to attack attached to the glass, the wicking effect of paper towels. So adhesion is where the water molecules or whatever liquid it is are liking to adhere to another material. The opposite of that is cohesion where the water molecules like to be attracted to each other. So this is adhesion is where they are attracted to another material. So you have the concave meniscus of water on the edge of a glass, the concave meniscus, convex meniscus of mercury in a barometer that actually goes down, or the uh, water drop on a vertical window. You know, it likes to adhere to, to the glass. The ability to rise up through soil, paint sticking to wall, scotch tape actually is adhesion, water droplets sticking to slope to vertical surface, oh yeah, I just mentioned that. And this one actually a student pointed to me, pointed out to me that's also true in brazing or soldering. Capillary action causes a filler metal to be drawn into the space between the work pieces. All right, gas pressure inside, and by the way, I should go back here. Notice that on the practice test, there is adhesion, so you might guess which subject is going to be on the proctored exam. Gas pressure inside an inflated stretch balloon is actually greater than air pressure outside the balloon, and that is because atmospheric pressure is pushing from the outside, and the elasticity of the balloon is also pressing, pre pressing inward, so that means the air pressure inside must be greater, which is why you, when you untie a balloon, actually uh, the air will rush out because it has the higher pressure inside. When submerging in glass with trapped air, that trapped air has a pressure more than atmospheric pressure because you have atmospheric pressure on top here, and he plus the hydrostatic pressure that you have from here to here. So obviously it has to be bigger. Suspend a pair of ping pong balls from two strings so there is a small space between them. If you blow air between the balls, they will swing toward each other. And that could be the Bernoulli effect, but it also could be that the airflow is actually adhering to the ping pong balls, which creates a force pulling them inward. And then they actually curve around the ping pong balls. So they're being deflected by them, so that's a force pulling the air out, which means the ping pong balls are just pull, pulled back in. So that could be actually Newton's third law. Notice the explanation is actually not given here. It's just saying, hey, that's what it is. Okay, that's actually it because the other computation problems you will find in the other recordings that I have posted. So that was the unit five practice test.